everyone. Uh, lovely day. Uh, have you come along to this session? Um, I hope you're all safe and well. I hope you're all managing to either work from home or travel into work safely. Um, very grateful that you're, you come along to, to the session. It's a glorious night, uh, certainly where I am in the Northeast. Um, but I, I'm really, really pleased that you, you're here. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Craig Abbott as our, our speaker this evening. Uh, Craig is, is head of uh, accessibility at, at DWP Digital um, and, and works very hard to create strategies to, to support the accessibility, compliance, culture uh, and education within the, the, the department. Um, the, the whole uh, legislation around accessibility and compliance is, is one that's challenging uh, many of us. Mm -hmm. um, but Craig has recently produced a DWP accessibility manual, which he's made a, a, available to us. And, is a, a, and I'm thinking, oh, some really good things in there that I'm taking to, to, to my uh, work, work environment. Um, so, you know, I'm really looking forward to, to Craig's talk uh, th this evening. Um, Craig's going to talk for about 45 minutes, uh, and then there'll be a chance at the end for any any questions. We'll do the, the hand raising piece and I will uh, try and uh, to uh, get people in, in the order that they raise their hand. If you wish to use the chat as we're going through um, to note down any questions that you have as we as Craig's going through his talk, then please feel free to do that. Uh, and Ian and I will manage the chat and, and use that as a, a, a source for the uh, for, for the um, the questions at the end. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Craig. Craig, thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, this, this talk's called Empathy and Accessibility. Um, it's just, you know, there's some stuff in here which uh, I've kind of learned over the years and some sort of examples of um, things that have tripped us up in the past and stuff. So um, yeah, I'll just kind of get on with it, I guess. Um, Oh, my slides aren't cycling. There we go. Um, just before I start, these slides are available in HTML. Um, I can share out kind of a PDF of the slides at the end, but ironically, that wouldn't be that accessible. So you can access a HTML version of this talk and any videos and stuff which I show in here do work on the online version, whereas they don't work in the sort of shared PDF. So if you want to go back and look at any of the, the videos and stuff, that's the place to do it. Um, yeah, so I'm the head of accessibility at DWP Digital. Um, I previously was an interaction designer. I've got an interaction design background, but I've always kind of been passionate about accessibility and I just kind of, um, it's good to be able to do it day in, day out, instead of just kind of being the ranty designer in the corner, always ranting about accessibility, I guess. If when it's in your job description, it's a bit more acceptable to be ranty about it uh, in every meeting you attend. Uh, I always like to start off this talk just by saying I don't have a disability yet. And the reason why I say yet is the prevalence of disability actually rises with age. So there's 6% of children, 16% of working age adults, and 45% of adults over state pension age who are sort of, I don't want to say registered as having a disability because you can't actually register to have a disability, but these statistics are people that are in the Office for National Statistics data. So they are people that are in receipt of uh, disability benefits or something like personal independence payments or disability living allowance. If you're in receipt of one of them benefits, then you end up in these statistics. But we know that um, there's a lot of people who have hidden disabilities and those aren't captured in these statistics. So while 45% of adults over state pension age, you know, it's one in nearly one in two people um it's actually probably much higher because there's a lot of people who aren't captured in these statistics so whilst it's high it probably could be higher uh, so people living with a disability are far more common than you might have realized it's certainly you know when i first started looking at the stuff i didn't realize it was so high um, it's around 11.9 million adults in the uk who are living with a disability uh, it's one in five people or 20 percent and in 2017, only 22% of adults who are living with a disability said they'd never used the internet. So that's about 2.6 million people. So if we do the maths on that, we end up with 9.3 million people 
in the UK alone who are living with a disability and browsing the internet. So there's 9.3 million people who are trying to buy things online, 9.3 million people who are trying to access government services or browse, you know, um, whatever websites it might be that you work on. Um, and when we think of a disability, we often think of wheelchair users, but you know, there's so many that are less obvious and this can make us ignorant. Um, it's actually only around 8% of people who require a wheelchair and out of that 8%, all of them don't need it all of the time. Some of them might just use it if they've got to go long distance or whatever. So um, yeah, I think, you know, when we do think of disabilities, often people think of people in wheelchairs and wheelchair ramps and those kind of things, but there's so many um, that are less obvious. It probably doesn't help that the internationally recognized symbol for disability is a person in a wheelchair. That probably adds to the, um, the sort of misconceptions or the assumptions that when we talk about accessibility, this is what we're talking about. Um, there's often, you know, the, the, the wheelchair icon often accompanies, often accompanies signage, which will say things like disabled parking. So, you know, the word disabled parking, you're automatically focusing on somebody being disabled um, when actually somebody might not be disabled um, in, in certain instances. There's been a bit of a push to try and move the sign to something which is a bit more empowering. So the, um, the, the there's kind of been a push, you know, to, to change that symbol and the new suggested one is somebody who's actually propelling themselves forward as opposed to somebody that's kind of just sat in, in the chair in the original. I think the old logo is about 50 years old now, so it's probably well in need of a bit of an update. Um, and the idea is to try and shift away from saying things like disabled parkin, because that's focusing on, you know, that's trying to imply that somebody is disabled who needs to use that space. And um, if we move towards something like accessible parkin, what we're actually saying is this space is available for anyone who has access needs, not somebody who may necessarily be disabled. Um, there's a bit of a push on changing these logos. So accessibleicon.org is um, kind of where this symbol's getting all of its push from. You can buy stickers and templates and all sorts of stuff to change the signage. Um, I was kind of mentioning this point in the talk that the idea is to get these things to change signage if you have your own properties, not kind of to just go vigilante and start changing them all over the place. Um, so disabilities and impairments are not the same. And that's why that language around the logo and the use of disabled parking and things is so important. Uh, an impairment is medical. It's the condition or the symptom that that person experiences. So you might have low vision or blindness, that's your impairment. Um, but a disability is when a person finds it difficult to perform everyday tasks to a level that's considered normal for most people. Um, I say the word normal in, you know, I, I don't like the, the, the use of the word normal. We could probably change that to say comfortable, but this was like, definition that I got off another website. But what we're saying is, you know, a disability is when um, when there's a mismatch, when somebody is trying to operate in an environment which isn't really set up for them, their impairment uh, isn't the sole cause of their disability. And it's the impairments part of it. And the other side is um, the fact that the environment isn't set up to deal with that impairment. And that's the really important point is that an impairment doesn't always mean that a person considers themselves to be disabled. So there's a couple of examples of that. The first example is to imagine you're a wheelchair user and you wanna get a book from the library. So you get up and you make your breakfast in your kitchen, which has been set up to deal with um, you know, your needs. You've got enough room to turn the chair around quite comfortably. The benches are low, you can reach everything. Everything's kind of um, within reach. You leave your house via the wheelchair ramp that you've had installed. You roll down onto the drive and then down onto the street. When you get to the crossings, the buttons are mounted low down the lamppost. The curbs are dropped so you can get into the road and then you can get up the other side. Um, so far, you know, everything is fine. And then you get to the library and there's 20 steps out the front of the library. There's no wheelchair ramp, there's no lift. There's no way to call for any assistance. There's, <clears throat> there's no way that you can get into the library um, in your wheelchair. So suddenly now you're disabled, everything up until this point, despite the fact that you're a wheelchair user and you may have an impairment, you haven't been disabled. But when you get to the library and there's 20 steps out the front and there's no way of them catering for the fact that you're in a wheelchair, that's where now suddenly you're disabled. Whereas 
had the library been built at ground level, if it had had a wheelchair ramp or something along those lines, you could have got into the library, found the book that you wanted, booked it out and went home the same way that you came. And you could have went from A to B, you could have, you know, done the task that you set out to do without ever having been disabled. And that's the important point is that, um, you know, people aren't disabled by their impairments, they're disabled by poorly designed environments. And um, an environment doesn't always just have to be a physical space, it can be a digital space. So the next example is imagine that you're colorblind and you want to check how well a team is playing before placing a bet. So you head over to a popular sporting website, you look at the Premier League table and you want to look at what form the teams are in because you don't want to bet on a losing team. So we kind of look at this table and Manchester City have won four and drawn one. Manchester United have won, did I say drawn four? Yeah, won four and drawn one. Manchester United have won three, lost one and drawn one. And these are denoted by using a green square for a win, a red square for a rectangle, sorry, red rectangle for a loss and a gray rectangle for a draw. But the problem is if you're colorblind, um, the problem is if you're colorblind, everything is just shades of yellow. So, um, yeah, sorry. I, I was just making sure my screen was still sharing, therefore I'd clicked off it. Yeah, if you're colorblind, everything's just shades of yellow and shades of gray. So it suddenly becomes really difficult to work out actually what is a loss and what is a draw. Um, so if we're using color, we shouldn't rely on color alone. We in government love to use red, amber, green as a status for risk. We love a rag rating. Unfortunately, red and green are the two colors, which, you know, if you're colorblind, red, green, colorblind is the most, um, prevalent form of color blindness. It affects one in 20 men and one in 200 women. So if you're using red and green to show the best and the worst aspects of things, um, the fact that you're using red and green and people are red, green, color blind really makes a difference. Um, that was the BBC Sports website a few years back. They've changed it now. They've still got the red, uh, the green and the gray, but now they use a W for a win and an L for a loss. So even if even if it's all shades of yellow, even if all of the colors removed completely and you can only see in shades of gray, you can still tell how many games they've won and how many games they've lost in the last five. There's a few ways that we can simulate color blindness. So this is simdaltonism, which is a Mac app. You can literally just drag a window over the top of anything that you're working on. It'll, um, it'll basically, anything that's inside the window will be simulated as if, um, you've, got, uh, as if you've got red, green color blindness. You can also use a Chrome plugin called Funkify. And if you're, you know, working in Photoshop or whatever, you can actually proof set, uh, proof check your work with the color blindness filters straight from in there. In on the topic of color, um, you know, when we're using color, the contrast is really important. If we get the color contrast wrong, it can make things really intense for people. For the purposes of this slide, I just picked the two colors which made me feel the most sick, but you know, for some people, this could just be black on white or something. People with dyslexia often prefer softer contrasts. There's something about softer contrasts which seem to anchor the words on the page a bit better. Um, I used to work with a designer who used to print everything out on a yellow paper, or they had um, like a sheet of yellow plastic, which they used to put over the top of things so that they could read them easier because the white on the black made the words all kind of move around. So. Um, yeah, having softer contrasts often helps people who've got dyslexia. But if we go too far the other way and we make everything low contrast, it can just make things difficult for everyone to read. So we kind of need to strike a balance. So we, you might have heard of um, WCAG or the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, but there's some um, kind of science to it. So we should be making sure that the color contrast between the foreground and the background color meets certain ratios. Um, we tend to work to 4.5 to one. And if you wanted to kind of check whether um, your color contrasts are meeting that ratio, you can just head to WebAIM's website and you can just put the foreground and the background color in it. It'll tell you very quickly if it's a pass or a fail. Um, there's also a Mac app called Color Contrast, which does the same thing, but you've just got a little drop down. You can click on the screen and kind of, it's a lot quicker than going to the WebAIM website and pasting in hex code. But the only thing that I would caveat with this one is sometimes it'll say it's a fail when actually it's a pass because 
color contrast for the Mac doesn't take into account font size, whereas the WebAIM website will. So something might be a fail if the font's too small, but in large font, it might be a pass. So if it does fail in color contrast, it's always worth just double checking it in WebAIM. Um, but to be honest, you probably want to be trying to make sure that it passes. Um, if, where, where you can, always use a color contrast that will pass in small and large text, and that way it'll be much more accessible for people. So we say that accessibility should be designed in from the start, and it shouldn't be an afterthought. If we design accessibility in too late, or we don't design it in at all, we can end up with solutions that just aren't accessible. Uh, this is a, one of my favorite um, my favorite examples of that. You know, they're saying there's a wheelchair ramp available. Please ask at the counter. But if you could get into the shop to ask at the counter, then you probably wouldn't need the wheelchair ramp in the first place. So the whole thing's just a pointless exercise. If we think about accessibility too late, we can end up with something that is accessible, but isn't particularly, um, it, it's not an aesthetically pleasing solution. Uh, the, you know, the wheelchair ramp in this image strafes all the way up that drive and it's perfectly accessible, but we can probably all agree that um, it doesn't look particularly pleasing. So when, when we're sort of, when we're looking to design things, there's always that, <clears throat> We should never make things inaccessible, but there's definitely sort of uh, ways we can make things accessible and make them look well designed. Then there is just bolt and accessibility on at the end and kind of undoing all of that hard work that we've done to make a, um, a well designed product. Uh, even if we're thinking about accessibility at the beginning, which we should do, if we implement it without talking to any users, that can also be disastrous. Uh, this is an example of Robson Square in Vancouver. And if you look up good accessible design, this example comes up quite a lot. But actually, it's not a good example of accessible design. Uh, basically, the, the idea of it being good accessible design is the fact that it's quite aesthetically pleasing. And they've kind of cut the ramp into the stairs. So the idea is that it's accessible for everyone, but it doesn't look a bit like an eyesore like the previous ramp that we saw. But the problem is, is when they built this ramp in Robson Square in Vancouver, they didn't talk to the people that had to use it. And what they've actually done is uh, the ramp's too steep. So when you're building a wheelchair ramp, you're supposed to have a gradient of one to 20, which means for every one meter you go up, you're supposed to go 20 meters along. And that creates a nice shallow gradient so that people can push themselves up it in a wheelchair. If you lose control coming down, you don't come down too quickly. Um, this is a gradient of one to 12. So it's nearly twice as steep as it should be, which means it's twice as hard to push yourself up it. And if you lose control, you come down twice as fast. Um, there's also no kind of grab rail. So, you know, if you get tired halfway up because it's twice as hard as it should be, you can't kind of stop and have a rest and hold on to the barrier because there isn't any. And if you were to lose control on the center ramp, then you can actually come down at quite a speed and jump straight off the end and obviously do yourself quite an injury. So whilst they've had the right idea and they've thought about accessibility, they haven't included the people that have to actually use it. And they've actually made something which is quite dangerous. And I think that's a, quite a pertinent point is that, you know, as designers, we don't usually make things inaccessible on purpose. It's just a lack of awareness or foresight. This is another example. This is, um, this is King's Cross Station and it, it got refurbed about 18 months ago and they, in fact, it might even be longer than that now. I've kind of lost track of time, but um, sometime in the last few years, it got refurbed. And the, the counter um, where you can kind of get tickets and stuff, the customer service counter was dropped at one side. And the idea of it being dropped at one side meant that, you know, people in wheelchairs and, um, you know, children and things, you know, you can have a face-to-face -face conversation through the glass. Um, but when the designers come around, as designers, we often design for ourselves and we don't really design um, being able to take into account everyone's needs. And what I think has happened here, and this is just my assumption, is that the designers sort of looked at this and went, ah, oh, this would look much better if we squared it all off. So they put the black sticker over the window, which makes it a nice rectangle, squares everything off. The problem is, is that now you've essentially blacked out the ability for the person in a wheelchair to have a face-to-face -face conversation which means that every time that somebody talks to them from the other side of the glass, they're gonna be talked down to because there's no way to have a face-to-face -face conversation at eye level. So just even little things like this, the designer obviously hasn't done that on purpose to exclude people in wheelchairs, but that's ultimately what's happened by them just not thinking uh, or not including people 
and in that design process. And sometimes we try to make things better and we actually make things worse. So this is an example of the GovUK uh, date component. This is the standard way that we collect dates in Gov, uh, gov.uk services. It's just three inputs. We've got day, month, and year. And it's expecting you to put numbers in there. So it says, for example, 31, 3, 1980. We were doing some user research and there was, um, there was a, a guy actually was putting September in that middle box. So he was writing 3 September 1986. And what was happening was he was getting a validation error, which was saying you need to enter a valid month. And he's getting quite confused because September is a valid month, but we were expecting it in a number and he wrote it in, in words. So we were thinking, well, that's, that's easy. What we'll do is if they put September in, we'll just convert it into a nine on the back end and we'll just let them through. And we kind of thought, you know, that's an easy fix. But what we didn't realize was um, when you're using Dragon software, so for anyone that doesn't know what Dragon is, basically you can talk commands at a computer. So I can say things like a uh, click button and it will find the buttons on the page and then give me options of which one to click or I can say click link or go forwards or go back and it'll, I don't have to type in things on the keyboard. I can just use my voice to control the computer. Um, and what we found was um, Dragon's actually pretty smart. It's smarter than we perhaps gave it credit for. So when we converted the original date input to accept text, we changed the type of field that it was. And we didn't realize at the time that when your, when Dragon's kind of looking for what to put into a field it's looking at the type of field that it is uh, the day component's been updated since this happened and this shouldn't happen anymore but at the time of doing this we changed it from a type of number to a type of text uh, so that it would accept september and it kind of had a bit of a knock-on effect which i'm going to show you now so this is a video of um it's a, it's a video of what happened. It isn't the actual video from the user research because we can't hold on to the recordings for GDPR and things like that. But this is me simulating with Dragon what happened in the original um, in the original user research session. So the audio is not going to work because I've got headphones and work MacBooks and whatnot. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk the commands into the microphone and hopefully it'll sync up with the video. Click D. Three. Press tab, nine, undo that, nine, undo that, O oh, nine, undo that, O oh, nine, undo that, zero nine, press tab. So hopefully that worked. And um, basically what happened in this instance was we converted the text field to be, uh, to accept um, words so that people could write September in, in words and it would work. And then when somebody came to use Dragon, they were saying, they were looking at the example and saying, oh, it wants numbers in here. So they were saying in one, in one case, they, wrote, they said O9 and it wrote O-H-N-I-N-E in the box. And that's because Dragon was going, ah, this is a text field. I should put words in here. So we'd actually tried to make things better and we've actually made things worse. So it's really important to make sure that, you know, we test with um, uh, enough people um, to make sure that we're not going to accidentally add in stupid accessibility issues like we had done with that. So it is important to test your product with people who use assistive, assistive technology. You can do a lot of testing on your own, um, but it's always better if you can, you know, include people who actually need to use the product and actually have these impairments because I can test a screen reader, but I can see the screen so whilst I can test the functionality of it, I can't test it in context because I'm always going to have a bit of a bias having already seen the screen. So, you know, unless you're going to make things sort of really realistic by turning your screen off before you even open the browser up, and I can, you know, we can test the functionality. We can say that it looks like it's going to work, but really we need to test it with people who actually have impairments. And then that way the the context and their understanding of the service and everything will give us a better representation of if we've made something which is accessible and not just something which is shown to work with a screen reader. Um, like I said, you can do some testing on your own device so you can learn how to use your device's own assistive technology. So uh, Windows and Mac both have tools built in now. Um, for Mac, you can use VoiceOver, which uh, is, you know, it just comes out of the box. You can turn it on and away you go. 
there's about 10 commands you need to learn for voiceover and we've actually got um, some testing templates which I can link you to which basically tells you what keys you need to press what you need to check and how you need to check it um, so you can kind of get started with some of this assistive technology testing if you're using windows it comes with um, windows narrator built in but it's not the best screen reader so if you're using windows Sorry, if you're using Windows, you can use NVDA, which is a free software. It doesn't cost you anything to download it, but it's a um, it's an open source screen reader, and that one's actually really, really good. Uh, but again, there's about 10 to 15 commands you need to learn just to bumble your way through, but we've got an NVDA testing template as well, which I'll, I'll share out. <clears throat> so this is an example of the testing template, which we have for uh, VoiceOver, but it's basically just saying, Okay, one of the things you need to test is that you can navigate by the headings and you can press Control, Alt, Function, and left arrow to go to the top of the page. And you press Control, Alt, Command, and H. And every time you press that, it should jump to the next heading. And what you need to check is confirm that you can navigate to every heading, make sure that all headings are read out correctly, all headings are selected in a logical order, and the headings are the correct level. For example, H3 relates to the previous H2, um, and any, any hidden headings relate to the content which follows it. So, that's one test you can do. There's a whole bunch of tests and hopefully, you know, if you test all of them, you can get a good understanding of if your web page is going to work with those assistive technologies. But we've got a bunch of these. We've got NVDA, we've got voice over, we've got voice control, which is Mac's version of Dragon, which I was just talking about where you can talk commands with the computer. And we've got a one for Apple Zoom, even though there's not a whole bunch of stuff you can test with that. But um, yeah, we've got a bunch of those, which I'll share out. Uh, yeah, so as I've just mentioned, uh, voice control is Mac's version of Dragon. You can turn that on again. If you've got Mac OS X Catalina or newer, you can turn voice control on. The first time you turn it on, it'll download a bunch of stuff. But once it's installed, you can just turn it on and off and you can get going with the voice commands. And if you're using Windows, you can use speech recognition, which does the same thing. This is often how I used to prototype things. So as a designer, it wasn't really my job to code things up properly. It was just my job to make something which looked like the thing that we were trying to test. So a lot of the time I just mash a load of JavaScript and a load of bad HTML into a, into a sort of uh, prototype and kit and, and then away we'd go and do some sort of testing. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, you can't, pro, pro, that's a prototype should be quick and they should be disposable but you can't really do accessibility testing with them because if your code's horrendous, it's always going to produce horrendous results. Um, so, you know, if you're going to go out and do some usability testing with people that do use screen readers and stuff, then um, make sure that you actually invest a bit of time to cleaning up that code and make it as close to the real thing as it's going to be. Because if you've got bad HTML, there's not really much point in doing usability testing. Um, the screen reader is not going to read out but I can show you these examples and you can actually see um, at the bottom, it'll show you what it's kind of selecting. But the idea is that in the first video, it's a badly prototype. It's a badly coded prototype, which I've knocked up and you can't actually get to the tab keys. So um, the screen reader is basically, so it's jumping from the menu at the top to the task list, but there's two tabs, which say, um, what do they say? Task to complete and claim details. So the screen reader physically cannot get to tasks to complete or claim details because it's just coded up terribly. Them two tabs can't be hit with the keyboard. You can only click them with a the mouse. And the next example is just showing how if you invest a bit of time and do things properly, you can very quickly make things quite accessible. So the next example is the exact same page, but we've just tweaked some stuff. And this time now, when you press tab, it'll go down and say task to complete, selected tab one of two. And you can press tab again and it'll say you're currently on a tab two of two to select this option press control option space so we can see that you know the, the tabs weren't clickable with the keyboard but just by tweaking some of the code and um, it is so if you're going to go out and do some um usability testing just make sure that you run it through the tools and stuff first because otherwise you could just derail your entire session and you've kind of wasted your time and the participants time because you can find a lot of this stuff yourself um, and I think also there's some misconceptions around screen readers. So not everyone who uses a screen reader is blind. So it's important to test with a range of people, you know, test with as many people as you can find that use tools for different reasons. So for example, a lot of people who 
and have dyslexia will use a screen reader because it's easier for the screen reader just to read it out than it is for them to actually read the content. They can see the content, but obviously their impairment is being able to decipher it quickly. So it reduces the cognitive load if they just click on the paragraph and have them read it out. So you tend to find that, you know, if somebody's got dyslexia and they're using a screen reader, they might highlight a paragraph and then have the screen reader read that out. Whereas somebody who's completely blind will use the keyboard to kind of navigate around using shortcuts. So if you can test with as many people as possible, you'll get a good understanding of the different ways that people use things and whether or not it's going to work for them in the context that um, you expect it to. Um, and we say you should research regularly with users on their own devices in their own environment. So if this is a bit harder with COVID and stuff, but what we used to say was if you can go to their environment, do that, you know, obviously now it's a lot harder to go into people's homes. I'm not sure I should probably recommend that right now, but that's what we would have said. You know, if you can go in and watch them in their own environment with their own devices, that's much better. In these kind of, in, because of COVID and in these kind of situations, um, it's probably not advisable to do that. We don't want to be going into vulnerable people's homes and things when there's this awful virus around. But what you can do is, um, you know, if you've set up a lab environment, um, have them bring their own device in. If you set a lab session up and you provide a laptop which has JAWS on it, for example, you might find that when the person comes in to use JAWS, although they use it on their own device, they can't use it on the one that you've set up because it's so configurable, they might have it set up a different way. So if you're going to do testing in a lab environment, which is probably what we should be doing at the moment, have somebody bring their device with them. So have them bring in their phone, which they use voiceover on, or an iPad or something of that nature, and, and watch them use their, their own, watch them do it on their own device. So that kind of brings us on to trying to get your team on board and things. Get, getting people on board is really hard. And um, you know, a lot of the time when we say you need to do accessibility, people go, why? Um, so we can try empathy building within teams. There's a few exercises we can do. Uh, these won't kind of make people understand exactly what it's like, but they might help people to empathize and to um, ultimately want to embrace accessibility. So we've probably all seen these by now, but these are Microsoft's um, kind of representations of different types of impairment. So not all impairments are permanent. Uh, for example, you know, you can be, um, you know, if you've got one arm, you are permanent, you know, that's a permanent impairment, but you might have an injured arm, which is in a sling. So you can't use that arm at the moment, but it will get better eventually. And then your impairment will go away. So that's a temporary impairment. And then you've got situational impairments where you might be holding a baby in one arm. So you've still only got one arm free. As soon as you put the baby down, you've got the use of the other one. But right at that moment, you can only use one arm. So it's a situational impairment. And um, a good example of this, which I always use is the fact that, you know, um, um, I don't have a hearing impairment. I'm not deaf. Um, I don't have an ear infection. So it's not a temporary sort of thing. But there's a lot of times when we were traveling, I'd be sat in the quiet coach on the train. So there'd be a video and if the video didn't have subtitles on it, then that meant that I couldn't get the content out of that video. So situational impairment might actually just be the environment that you're in doesn't allow the type of media that you're viewing. So if the video had subtitles on it, everyone would benefit from it, even if those people don't actually have an impairment. Um, lip reading is hard. So a lot of the time people assume if you can't hear, you can lip read and that just isn't true. Uh, lip reading is really difficult. And even those that can do it well, um, they can only do it well if the environment's set up to kind of make it as easy as possible. There's some posters from um, Action Deafness which kind of represent that. So, you know, a lot of the time when I would be sat in meetings, I'd sit with my hand on my chin and my elbow on the table and my hand would be obscure on my face and I'd just kind of be muttering behind my mouth. And obviously if somebody's trying to lip read and they can't see your lips, then um, that's a, a terrible situation, um, you know, it, one of them says, I can't hear you if you don't face me. So, you know, if we're having conversations and we're looking either side um, and we're not talking directly to that person, or we've got a head down because we're taking notes, they then can't see the lip read. Um, I mumble quite a bit and also I've got quite a heavy accent, so that can make it quite difficult. Um, and again, the last one's just speak one at a time. If there's lots of people talking, they miss most of the conversation because you can only kind of lip read by looking at one person at a time. So yeah, lip reading is really difficult. There's a couple of exercises here which are designed to show you how hard it can be. This is basically um, just, this is Malcolm who is a product manager in DWP. 
he's mouthing two words. They're two completely different words, but they make the same mouth shape. So you just got to have a little think about what he could be saying, and I'll, I'll give you the answer in a second. So he was saying chair and share. Um, you can see how them two might get a little bit mixed up. Uh, this is Becky, who's a senior interaction designer on DLP. She's uh, doing the same thing. So two different words. Uh, so she was saying talent and salad, which again, two completely different words, same mouth shape. And the last one's my favorite. So this is James Gordon. He's a front end developer on the team I used to work on in DWP. Um, he's got a beard like me, so it hides a lot of his, the shape of his face. So you can't really see his face um, contorting as much as you can when people talk uh, in a kind of exaggerated manner. He also mumbles like I do quite a bit. So the beard hides his face and he doesn't really enunciate that clearly. So it becomes really difficult. But James was actually saying colorful and I love you, which I suppose if you got them two mixed up could be a little bit embarrassing. So yeah, I suppose with those things, the thing that you've got to think about is, you know, this is one word and you would have the context of a sentence usually, but it is just an example of how hard it can be because a lot of the times when we're talking, our mouths make the same shapes, even when we're saying different things. There's only so many shapes you can make um, with your mouth, despite the fact that different words are coming out. Um, you can get vine simulation glasses. So these are just a bunch of safety glasses, which have been, um, they've been modified to simulate visual impairments. There's a real strong caveat with any of these things, these glasses in particular, that we don't want we want people to empathize with people's situations. What we don't want to do is invoke the wrong response. We don't want people to feel sorry for people. We don't want to invoke sympathy. We want to invoke empathy. We want people to come away from a session having used any of these tools and be like, I understand why we need to do accessibility now because things are terrible for these people. What we don't want to do is come away from there and be like, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that's not me and I feel really sorry for these people. These aren't, that's not what we're looking for. So there is a caveat with these glasses and all of these examples is that they're good if they're used in the right context, but we need to be really careful that we don't invoke the wrong emotional response from people. But these vine simulation glasses do simulate things like tunnel vision um, or macular degeneration. And what we sometimes do is print off a bunch of government forms, which are notoriously terrible to fill in at the best of times. And then we just have people go through and try and fill them in with these glasses on. And we normally find that people just get sick and give up halfway through. You can unplug the mouse and have people try and do an everyday online task. So just rip the mouse out the back of a computer and then have somebody go to Google, Google the weather and tell us what the weather is going to be like on Saturday, for example. Um, we usually find people struggle to open the browser. That Once they're in the browser, they're not too bad. They know to use the tab key and stuff, but usually just trying to open the browser is particularly difficult, especially if you sneakily put it on the start menu to start with and you don't highlight anything on the desktop. Um, you can play a video with the screen turned off. So if you're listening to the radio, for example, uh, people know that you can't see any of the content. So they're deliberately more descriptive in the way that they talk. But if you're watching a video, they assume that you can see the video content, in which case they're not descriptive in the way that they talk because they assume that half of the content is there visually. So if you turn the screen around or you turn the screen off and you play a video so that people can just hear the sound, and then have them try and storyboard what they think was on the video, just have them draw quick sketches as to what they think might have been on the screen. You often find that very rarely do people get it right. Um, <clears throat> an alternative to that, or the inverse to that, I suppose, is to play a video and turn the sound off. So this is an example of a newsreader. You're gonna have to have a little guess at what she might be talking about. So she's looking pretty enthusiastic. Um, she's leaning into the camera looks super interesting. There's some grass on the side of a building. Um, some more grass on the side of a building. There's a cement truck and a bunch of roadworks. There's a bunch of people in high vis vests and hard hats, presumably part of the roadworks as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll not ask anyone to shout out, but you know, have a little think about it and then we'll have a look at what it was that um, they were actually talking about. So what they were actually saying is, there's too much pollution and they're doing a bit of an experiment to grow grass on the side of buildings. Um, it's in Victoria and London. And the idea is that it'll absorb some of the, the carbon dioxide from you know, the atmosphere 
Uh, the roadworks, the cement truck, the people in high vis vests had absolutely nothing to do with the video, but they were quite prominent in the shot, so you could understand how people might come to the wrong conclusion that they were actually important. Um, so yeah, we should always add captions to videos um, as part of the, I think it's a double A criteria for um, the web content accessibility guidelines. They say all videos need to have, uh, if, if there's people talking in them, they should have subtitles. You can use a program called AgiSub, which is free. It's an open source program, and that can help you to create SRT files, which you can upload with videos to YouTube and, uh, YouTube and things like that, where it'll, um, you can turn the captions on and off. Um, AgiSum is a little bit clunky. You have to tell it the start and end times of all of the subtitles, so it can get a little bit um, tedious. So you can kind of use, if you use AgiSub with YouTube, itself you can kind of it's a bit of a hack and a bit of a workaround but what you can do is you can upload the video to youtube and have youtube automatically caption the video now i say you can use youtube kind of what what i'm gonna caveat is if you upload the video to youtube it will automatically create an srt file and automatically caption the video but the captions will be terrible so you can't rely on youtube for the captions but what you can do is you can you can get it to do the captions, then you can download the captions, and then you can either edit them yourself in Notepad or something like that, or you can or, or you can go back into AgiSub and upload the file that YouTube gave you. And that way, you've got the timings and everything already done, and you just need to edit the content. So upload it to YouTube, download the SRT file, put the SRT file into AgiSub, and then edit the content. That's kind of the flow that I use for my videos, and it seems to work quite painlessly. Um, don't rely on YouTube for automatically capturing your videos because it will get them wrong, particularly if you're like me and you've got a particularly strong accent, it gets them terribly wrong. This is an example of how wrong it can get them. I did this talk at Sunderland Digital. I said, don't use YouTube for the captions. They used YouTube for the captions and I categorically say at no point in the talk did I say this quote. I won't read it out, but um, yeah, I categorically didn't say that at any point in the talk. At the very least, include a transcript of the video. This can just be a text file or a HTML page that somebody can read. So in government, we're bound by accessibility law, which says we have to be WCAG AA compliant. So we have to include closed captions on videos. Um, if you're a private sector company, obviously you're not bound by the law. It's better if you can include closed captions, but if not, at the very least, just include a transcript of the video. And that's basically just whatever, you know, in a Word document or an open text format, like a text file or something, just include what was said in the video and anything that was pertinent, have it read a bit like a script. So if somebody enters the room halfway through the video, just add that in there so that people who are reading it can read it like a script and they get what was going on in the video. Obviously, if you're a public sector body, you need to include those captions. The Home Office have designed a bunch of posters for designing for different impairments. So there's things like, you know, um, do's and don'ts for screen readers, for low vision, for dyslexia. Um, they say, you know, things like if you're designing for users in the autistic spectrum, do write in plain language and don't use figures of speech like idiom, an idiom, sorry. So an idiom is something like uh, it's raining cats and dogs. Um, you know, don't kind of, if, if you're not, if you're, if you've, if you've got an autistic, sorry, if you've got an autistic spectrum disorder, then you can take things quite literally. So it's raining cats and dogs can be quite confusing. And also if English isn't your first language, it's raining cats and dogs will make no sense because it's a typically British saying. So just always write in plain language and be really clear about what it is that um, you're saying and don't kind of try and be clever with the way that you're talking things. This is an example of a website called kidly.co.uk. Um, I tried to buy a present for a friend of mine who'd recently had a baby and um, uh, I got really frustrated when I was trying to check out because it, it was telling me, oops, you forgot to pop in your number. Don't be shy. And this is an example of how um, with error messages and things, you can quite quickly make things inaccessible. So if we're to break this down, you know, oops, you forgot to pop in your number. Well, how do you pop in a number? That's a, you know, an idiom. Um, and also it's saying things like don't be shy. We're making assumptions about the type of person you are based on what you did on the form. And I didn't put my mobile number in there because I didn't want to be spammed with a whole bunch of stuff. It wasn't that I was shy. You know, it's, um, it's, it's not a dating app. It's the fact that I didn't want to be spammed. But they've used that to draw conclusions about the kind of person that I am and then almost shame me into giving it out. 
Um, and also the error messages are below the field. So if you're using a screen reader, you don't actually know that there's an error happened until you navigate past the field, which caused it. Um, sorry, there's a cat trying to get, get away cat, sorry. Um, so yeah, um, when you're doing error messages, just make sure that they're really clear. Don't try and be funny. Don't draw conclusions about people um, and just make them really clear and concise. Um, we've got a lot of guidance around error messages in the gov.uk design system, which was written by uh, an awesome content designer called Stephen Potter. Um, and basically, yeah, you know, things like error messages and things, they're not really the place to give your brand a voice. Just tell users what they need to do. Uh, you need them at your name. It can't be blank, something along those lines. We can use automated accessibility sort of testing software. You can get plugins for Chrome. This is an example of one, which is called Wave. Um, there's a few of them, there's Axe, there's Wave, there's Arc. They all, in a, in a matter of seconds, can go through the HTML of the page and they can kind of make recommendations on things that you might have messed up. Um, but we can't rely on them. Automated tools in there, it, like sort of by themselves, aren't enough. Um, GDS have actually done, uh, it's a few years ago now, so there's a few more sort of plugins which have came out since then, which aren't included in this audit. But GDS did an audit a couple of years back and they found that even the best tools, even the ones you pay for, like SourceSite, um, they only find 40% of the issues. They put 142 known accessibility issues on one page, and then they threw all of these tools at them. And the best ones found 40% or less. So there's 60% of them issues would have just still been there, but wouldn't have been found. Um, so, you know, it's good to kind of, if you use a combination of these tools, you know, if you use Axe, Wave, and Arc, they're all free. And if you use all of them together, they all find slightly different things. So you can tend to get around 40% of known issues if you use two or three of these tools alongside each other, rather than just kind of paying for one out of the box. What I will say is SourceSite is really, really good. If, if you can afford to, to buy it, it is really good um, tool because it'll actually crawl a site, whereas the other checklist will only run against one page at a time. So you have to load the page up and then run the checks where a source site will actually crawl a website and then it'll give you a report at the end. So um, the free tools are good. The paid tools are good. It just depends what you're going for. And I think that's the point to make with all of this stuff is that tools can be good to build empathy and find really obvious errors, but they can never replace usability testing. Like we should be doing manual testing. We should be going out and testing things because people don't have to use them and just relying on automated tools and a bit of empathy building in teams um, isn't really good enough to say that things are truly accessible. Uh, like Liz Jackson says, inclusion is better than empathy. And although this talk's called empathy and accessibility, we could argue it should be inclusion because if you include people in the process, you're more likely to get it right. The people who built Robson Square in Vancouver probably had empathy for people who used wheelchairs, but they didn't include them and they came to the wrong conclusion. And that's the point is that more than one in three people have shown unconscious bias against those with a disability. It's actually higher than the unconscious bias for race or gender. So the whole point of it being an unconscious bias is that we actually assume people's needs wrongly because we, we have a bias against, um, it's, an, it's a subconscious thing. We don't realize we do it, but we think that we know what they need and we don't. And one in three people have that problem. So we shouldn't just go designing things for people without including them because, you know, 33% of the time we'll probably get to the wrong conclusion. And I think it's a bit easier in government because by law or public sector websites and apps, uh, I should probably change this slide because it's now past that date, but there was a deadline in September, 2021, where it said all public sector websites and apps needed to be accessible by that point. And, um, that date's obviously passed now. So we're in the situation where if, if something isn't compliant now, um, we're kind of in hot water over it and we need to very quickly sort that out. There's actually content all over gov.uk that says you'll be breaking the law if your website or app is not accessible. And there's gonna be government checks to make sure that the website and apps follow the rules. So um, there's a central office now. So um, we've got a monitor and reporting body who's responsible for basically checking gov uh, services and public sector services to make sure they're meeting the standards and they're going to test thousands of sites per year. So if we're not accessible, we'll be found out and we need to make sure that, you know, we don't land ourselves in hot water by getting picked up in these checks. So we need to make sure that everything that we're putting out there is up to scratch. 
Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean the private sector companies are exempt. You know, it, at the moment, this stuff does apply to um, public sector. It's the public sector bodies accessibility regulations. But if we look at what happened in America, and America is about 10 years ahead of us with regard to accessibility law, um, some of their private companies have landed in hot water. So Winn-Dixie is a private corporation um, and they actually went to court. They got a class action lawsuit. They went to court and tried to fight it and they actually lost in court. They said, nope, you're too big. You've got too many users. You need to be accessible. And Target is another, they're a big clothing chain in America. They were kind of watching what happened with the Winn-Dixie situation because they were getting sued at the same time. And when Winn-Dixie lost their case, Target then decided to settle out of court rather than go to court and lose. And it cost them $6 million to settle. So if you're a big corporation and you've got the money there to do the accessibility work, it's a lot better to do that than it is just to go to court and hope for the best because it hasn't turned out very well so far. Uh, in fact, there's a whole bunch of big American companies that are being sued or have been sued over the fact that their websites aren't accessible. So if you're a big hitter in the private sector, it's only going to be a matter of time before you're going to fall in line with um, the public sector regulations anyway. In fact, um, Beyonce is one of the latest people that kind of found themselves in that situation. So Beyonce has a company called Parkwood Entertainment and Parkwood Entertainment um, are responsible for releasing all of the tickets for Beyonce concerts. And basically when Beyonce released her tickets, she released them on an inaccessible website. And there was a whole bunch of people who are blind got together and there's a class action lawsuit because they're saying, you know, we're blind. Music is one of the only forms of entertainment we have. And we've been denied equal opportunity to get tickets because Beyonce has released them on a website, which is inaccessible. So although you're these are private sector companies and they are in america we can probably assume that this is going to follow suit over here as well so if you're a really big organization you have a lot of users or you're one of the the only sources of um you know if you've got a, if you kind of corner a niche market or whatever then these things probably are going to apply to you um relatively soon and I suppose we can look at that and say we should spend your money on accessibility and not lawyers. It probably would have cost Target significantly less money than $6 million just to have done that accessibility work in the first place. Um, I always kind of like to finish the talk off just with this quote from Molly Watt. Uh, Molly Watt's got Usher syndrome. She was um, born deaf and then has progressively went blind. Um, and she does some really good talks. If you ever get to see Molly Watt talk, I really um, recommend going to see her. She's great. Um, but she says, you know, 20% of the population have blue eyes. This is the same statistic as people who have a disability. Like, imagine saying you can't use this product because you've got blue eyes. That's essentially what we're doing when we make something inaccessible. Um, and yeah, we can say, you know, if your product is accessible, you've got access to another potential 10 million customers. Um, and accessibility experts are really rare. People will pay for that knowledge. You know, if you're a consultant, if you're an agency, if you're doing accessibility work, you're ahead of the curve. And at the moment, um, it's quite a lucrative thing. So unfortunately, money makes the world go round. We should do accessibility because it's the right thing to do. But if you're in a private sector organization, then there's still an opportunity to do accessibility and it pays quite well. Um, but ultimately, we should be passionate about accessibility because it's the right thing to do. If we design things with accessibility in mind, then it just makes things better for everyone. You never know when you're in a quiet coach of a train, you might need subtitles. And just to finish off, this is my favorite quote by Colin Oakley, who is a front end developer in uh, DWP. But he once got really irate and he was just like, you know, why are we even talking about accessibility? It's a human right and it should just be done by default. And I think that's where we need our culture to get to. And that's everything from me. I appreciate I've run a little bit over, but I do have time for questions if anyone's got any. Oh, thank you, Craig. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and, you know, I could have listened to you all, all night. Um, there's some really, really excellent examples in there. I, I'm sure that you've got people people thinking about all sorts. There's certainly been some quite technical discussion in the in the chat about various different editors and tools and 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 the like. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you.